Um, I want to say thank you first to everyone uh, who sponsored this grant and to everyone who's attending the conference. It's really nice to see practitioners, policymakers, and uh, multilateral stakeholders in the same room. Um, as a word of background, on this particular project. Um, I feel fortunate that we had small pots of money over the course of the last 15 months, I guess maybe 16 or 17 months at this point, to look at risk to trafficking, particularly in Sudan. And so this project built on a project that started only focusing on Sudan and was bigger in scope, looking at modern slavery and human trafficking and the impacts of COVID on incidents and prevalence. And then a second one that looked at the gender dimension of that. And then this one um, really narrowed in on a particular area of concern that is both something that I study as a migration scholar, but also something that came out of those previous research projects. And that was that we saw an increase in migration aspiration, obviously associated with COVID and um, as well as respatialization of borders associated with COVID, right? So it became both more necessary for people to move to access income, but borders were closed. There are other reasons that people started moving, but in that first set of data we looked at, <clears throat> we saw that people were basically being forced to move to survive. Um, and that in the process of moving, they were at risk of exploitation. Um, and so this research project came from that and focused specifically um, on Eritreans. What is happening and what this project seeks to understand and explain is why people are becoming vulnerable and where um, and to what. So what, what, it, what did I find was happening and what did I explore? Um, effectively, people who are crossing from Eritrea into Sudan uh, were being abducted at the border and taken almost immediately to Libya, at which point they were being handed over to someone who kept them in detention um, for a period of eight months. I, ha I had interviewed a few other people who had been longer for years. Um, and they were tortured, uh, experienced extreme sexual violence, and um, were held hostage. Often it was videotaped, and those videotapes were sent back to their families. Phone calls were made to their families until money was collected through diaspora connections. Again, the average price asked was 5500 It ranged a little bit 6000 One person was transferred between detention centers after raising money through family on Facebook and was asked to go through that same process again. So anywhere the, the people who I spoke with were, were, were being held hostage for costs ranging up to $12,000 US. Um, I uh, originally was interested in sort of both spatially and socio-spatially where people were being abducted and where uh, in their journeys, their migratory journeys, they became vulnerable to trafficking. Um, and I wanted to understand how COVID impacted that with the idea that we could then target interventions. Um, part of what became problematic in the research project is that I found that mostly we know where people are abducted. Mostly we understand where people are abducted and taken. Um, we have a lot of information. I mean, I have the UNHCR map here that I pulled from their website, which shows crossing points. I found that the people who I interviewed and spoke with were abducted either directly at the crossing point or in um, Khartoum. And um, most of them could draw on a map for you where they were kept in Libya. Um, they may not have known the exact names of the people who abducted and took them, but there was a lot of information already captured. And so yet we continue to think of human trafficking and modern slavery, we describe them as an invisible crime. Um, and yet there's a lot of information here. So, so the process of this research became um, more for me about figuring out some of what those displacement factors were throughout the journey, what, what, led, what led them to migrate, did that have anything to do with particular individual vulnerabilities, what was happening in Sudan that might be contributing to those vulnerabilities, and um, to a lesser extent, what's happening in Libya. Uh, so this research is based on the experience of Eritreans who moved and it calls on those previous research projects, which interviewed stakeholders as well as migrants to ask about how the pandemic combined with current conflicts have influenced migration, both routes, demographics, and motivations. And then I use the IOM determinants of migrant vulnerability framework to look at where vulnerabilities lay at the four scales that are contained in that model. And I can, and I'll go over that, but they, um, the, if you're not familiar, the framework identifies vulnerabilities at the individual, household, family, 
uh, community and structural level. And, and I, I sort of diagram this out and talk a little bit about how they're intersectional in my findings. Um, so again, the most uh, recent round of interviews included 13 Eritrean survivors, um, eight men and four women. And I, I requested and um, received data from the 4MI Mixed Migration Center on air chain experience is over the course of the pandemic. Um, and so they did three separate data pools. I don't talk about that much in my findings, but I used it sort of to understand the background information um, and what they were seeing on a larger scale. So they had a couple of hundred um, surveys done by refugee enumerators in Sudan, focusing on Eritrea's um, air trains moving through space. And then um, it's important to note that because of COVID, I couldn't travel to do interviews. And so I was fortunate to have the assistance of Iab, who uh, is the founder of Africa Monitors. Um, and he worked with people on the ground and we conducted interviews uh, over the telephone. Right, okay. So in terms of um, key findings, First, I found that COVID did lead to a reduction in mobility and that impacted the ability to earn an income in Eritrea. Um, there, there were roadblocks put in place that kept people from moving around, people who would have um, moved throughout the state uh, for any number of reasons um, were, not able, were not able to do so. Um, that was combined with, and that was, uh, yeah, that was enforced by uh, the military. Um, there was also an increase in forced conscription. So Eritrea operates a policy of forced conscription for people 18 to 50. Um, it used to be an 18 year, uh, it used to be an 18 month cap. It's now um, interminable. So you can, you can be forced to work for the government um, for as long as they see fit. Um, and so that has picked up and forced roundups of people are happening more because of the conflict in the Tigray region. Um, and because of that, people had fewer earners in their household um, and people who work for the government only make about 25 US dollars per month and that was not enough to support families. So more people were sending someone or seeing someone leave the country because conscription had picked up and they're being forcibly um, picked up and deployed. Um, this led to uh, a, a sort of what I call blind migration. Um, because of the surveillance state in Eritrea, combined with the shoot to kill migration policy, which means that people cannot migrate legally, effectively, um, uh, and uh, there are armed forces um, who, who, yeah, who operate a shoot to kill policy, um, people have to have to migrate without uh, information. And so people operate within small social circles to get information, but because the surveillance state limits their access to information and limits their ability to share information within their social networks, people are making decisions based on very little info and trusting a person, a facilitator, a smuggler who would get them to the border. Um, these people walked, everyone I spoke with walked to the border and then walked across the border. Um, at the border, they were immediately turned over by the person who had uh, gotten them to the border. Sometimes, um, sometimes there was um, violence involved where this may perhaps the smuggler didn't know. Sometimes there's an exchange of money from the smugglers and traffickers, um, but they were abducted at the border and then frequently just driven straight to Libya. Um, uh, we found that, or the IOM cites the statistic that 73% of people who are migrating across what's called the central Mediterranean route experience a form of exploitation. Um, so uh, the people whose experiences that I describe here are fairly, fairly common. I mean, three quarters of people moving across this route, which goes through Libya and then North Italy, Malta, um, experience a form of exploitation. Um, what uh, a secondary problem though for people was that Sudan experienced a coup in October and so conditions have deteriorated. Um, that's combined with the effects of COVID. So there are 1.1 million refugees, um, 126,000 of which are Eritrean. Many are in camps in Eastern Sudan. There are a lot also in Khartoum. Um, and COVID caused uh, economic massive economic problems. Uh, the inflation rate was like 275%. 
Um, camps were in lockdown and so there was an access to public space. There was a reduction in institutional support. So uh, healthcare providers closed, schools closed, um, places where people would have had informal check-ins with providers where providers may have noticed um, exploitation or sexual exploitation was happening. There's a reduction in international presence. So people who um, may have been providing an element of security were no longer, but mostly what we saw was that people lost employment. And so they worked in the informal economy. Uh, they, they don't have access to working in the regular economy um, with refugee status. And, and so uh, jobs like doing laundry um, disappeared because people didn't have extra cash to pay people to do their laundry. Um, people working in tea stalls and markets were not able to gather publicly and so therefore couldn't earn an income. Um, that put people at risk of, of, of negative coping mechanisms like sex work um, and uh, child, rape, child marriage and child labor, which I, I don't talk about in this paper, but also continu continued migration with the use of a smuggler or a facilitator, which often then had them turned over to, um, to a trafficker later in the process. Um, there's also been um, an increase in Sudan, according to the people who we spoke with, of targeting by security forces or police who asked them for their refugee card or form of identification. They may or may not rip it up. They may or may not put them in jail. Um, and they asked for 500 US dollars in exchange for not doing that or for releasing them. Um, and so people do not feel safe in Sudan and they are concerned about um, going back through Libya, these are people who've been returned, but are really considering risking secondary migration and risks of re-trafficking because they don't feel they can go through South Sudan safely. And they think that if they can raise enough money, they can navigate Libya more safely. Um, without a pathway to regularization, they have no long-term security. Without access to employment, they have no pathway to economic security. And with the desecurization and the, and the military coup, uh, sort of like institutional and structural supports have disappeared. They don't have access to social welfare as it is except predominantly through, through multilateral organizations. Um, and one of the things that came out, again, our findings was that when the transitional government before the coup was in place, they were building momentum towards securing international aid, but because of COVID, it was limited in availability. And because it was distracted, the, the funds went to other things to, to deal with the pandemic. And um, it was taking Sudan and, and the transitional government a while to, to sort through things like being removed from the state sponsors of terrorism list. Um, so I've talked a little bit about this. One of the other things that came out of interviews is that refugees um, didn't trust in the process anymore. That was a there was degraded trust in institutions of third country resettlement. Uh, for instance, when this when the system in the United States effectively closed under the Trump administration, having that lack of hope, if they're even if they're high on the on the list for resettlement, um, they having waited and waited and waited, they were unwilling or they lost faith that they would ever be resettled. Um, and so people were taking riskier forms of, of migration. Um, and again, once the military coup happened, they didn't feel like those processes were going to be protected. And people were citing incidents of other refugees buying spots on the um, list, whether that is true or not, it came up in multiple interviews and had destroyed their trust in the system. So people were purchasing the right for resettlement um, and people are unwilling to engage because their institutional trust had been diminished. Um, okay, and then, um, in terms of Libya, we, we found um, that the situation in Libya often involved detention within detention houses that were managed by um, militia actors, but that people had in the process of both getting to Libya and within Libya, people had exposure to institutions. They had exposure to actors who would, one would have thought, um, be positioned to intervene. Some were rescued by UNHCR and then moved to another detention center, for instance. Some were raided by the military. Uh, some of the detention centers were raided by the military, um, but that didn't result in them being turned over and then, and then repatriated. Um, there was a woman whom I spoke with who was pregnant um, and in, the, in the detention setting and taken to a hospital to give birth. Um, and then return to the detention setting with the baby. 
So when they had interactions with actors, there were other people who, when they were crossing the, the border, um, interacted with people who they thought were the military or, or security forces. Um, nobody intervened. Uh, that sort of was echoed in our stakeholder interviews where people um, told us that in previous administrations, the, the, the border security forces, um, different routes were given out as a way of raising revenue because there wasn't enough income to pay these basically um, workers. And so they could tax migrants as they moved across or traffickers or uh, you, you take a bit of the money themselves. Um, and uh, it was an, yeah, it was a part of the business. There's been a bunch of work written in around 2013 um, on identifying who the actors were in the previous administration and who they are in the Eritrean government who facilitate migration um, through irregular means and through trafficking. And so those routes are, are known and those actors are identified. Um, and in any case, where we might have seen people intervene, we did not see people intervene. Um, and thus people are exposed to generalized violence um, and severe sexual violence. Um, okay, this uh, is sort of how I would cluster the intersectional factors that I identified across the four scales of the IOM's um, determinants of migrant vulnerability. And again, I just really wanna emphasize that it was the way that they worked together, right? So um, people became vulnerable because of factors which worked across different scales. So like I was saying, people chose or, or were forced to migrate from Eritrea because of policy of forced conscription combined with economic degradation and the lack of ability to, regulate, to migrate regularly uh, uh, narrowed their choices. Um, of how to get out of the country and sort of force them to rely on, a, on someone who could uh, help them navigate that pathway. So I saw that across a number of, and, and there's a, several factors here um, that, work, that work together. What do, what do I suggest or what is our policy, um, what is that, what do kind of our findings suggest about policy implications? Um, we would suggest that the processing of refugee applications needs to be speeded up. Uh, it's taking a very long time and that's limiting people's security, particularly in this time when they're being picked up and harassed. Um, relatedly, there are very few places that you can apply for refugee status within Sudan. And so increasing the number of places where people have access to application would help um, ensure people's safety. I spoke with people who are in Khartoum uh, irregularly who needed to go back to the camp near the border where they could register, but uh, were afraid to do that because they knew people who in the process of going there had been abducted and um, trafficked. Um, within camps, uh, there were people who, including camp administrators, raised concerns about safety within the camp, um, that people came into the camp. One, uh, a, a, a police officer involved with the Rock, which is um, an organization in Khartoum to um, increase yeah, security. Uh, I call them honeypots, right? People are coming into the camps, they're recruiting people, it's a business and people are being sold and then trafficked. Um, so increasing access to basic security and services and safety within the camps. Um, camp administrators were talking about doing things like putting lighting in areas where alcohol was being sold and where there's active sex work um, to increase accountability. Um, so there were interventions happening, but obviously expanding those would be helpful. Uh, similarly, with, uh, with refugees, urban refugees in Khartoum, there was an increase um, of children begging in the streets. There was an, uh, an increase of, of um, desecuritization. And so uh, people were asking for sort of more presence maybe of multilateral organizations. Um, similarly, uh, having safe houses, having actors positioned at the, at the crossing points would be useful and more present um, without making it sort of the criminalization of migration, but provide, providing safety quarters for people who are coming out of Eritrea and entering Sudan is essential, particularly now that Ethiopia 
it is a choke point and people can't get out that way. So as people are crossing and seeking safety, providing them the access to the legal means to file for asylum um, is essential. Um, it, investigating and, and fighting corruption within gatekeeper roles in filing for refugee status and in, uh, in Sudan, but also figuring out a way to negotiate this current situation in Libya. And lastly, yeah, I spoke about open refugee sites across Sudan. Um, and so that's it. And I just want to say a quick thank you again to Iab and who helped facilitate the, the interviews, as well as the RTAC grant and um, previous research partners who helped in the first projects, uh, GPG, Waging Peace, and RUSI, and most particularly to research participants. Thanks for a great presentation, Audrey. Sorry. Um for the mute uh, talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, very heartbreaking and interesting at the same time. Um, can you tell us a little bit around the challenges of collecting data or making sense of data that already exists? Uh, I know that's something you, you raised when we had a talk earlier last week that I think is interesting. So how do you partner with NGOs and make the best of what they have, for example? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that came out of this is a real need, at least for me and my own research process, to figure out how to co-write and develop projects with partners on the ground who have the information. I think that they're, like I started by saying, there's a lot of information out there and it's not it's either not being heard or it's not being communicated in a way that is uh, appealing to people who are in a position to intervene or there's just not support for those interventions, right? And some of that, some of that has to do with the ways that policies have been implemented, right? So migration has been criminalized and you know, the EU through the Trust Fund for Africa has spent a lot of money on criminalizing migration in the region, which has made it uh, difficult for people to seek humanitarian protection in a number of geographies. Um, it's sort of easy to say that, but more difficult to come up with solutions within that context, right? Because it's easy to criticize that, but um, a lot of these interventions would have to fit within that framework. Uh, so in terms of collecting data on the ground, I was really, I feel very fortunate to have research partners who are positioned as activists, but also who've conducted research um, on the ground. Africa Monitors is really useful. And uh, I'd say the downside in this climate was that I, it feels like helicopter research to be here and not there, but there was no way, I'm certainly to get institutional clearance to go after the coup, but also during COVID. So um, I had to rely on people who had good uh, knowledge and who I trust and who are, you know, vetted researchers. Um, and I feel really fortunate to have worked with them. Thank you. Like some of them must be more like uh, like easy to implement or to reach than others. So do you have you started to work out how to prioritize your recommendations and um, and what do you think would be the the first thing maybe to like to look at and put energy in that would have the you know the largest impact uh, in this list of recommendations? Um, I think that my understanding is that the transitional government um, that was removed last October was putting together a, or looking at a durable solutions platform for the refugee situation in Sudan. Um, and I think that if that could be back on the table, that would be extremely useful because what went into that uh, building, building consensus around what's, you know, what's in that document and what they address um, and getting buy-in from the current government would be, would be the most sensible place to start. I think, um, probably the thing that came out the most from, from individuals and might be the easiest, might be, is, is increasing the number of places you can file for refugee status and decreasing times. So figuring out ways to streamline those um, vetting systems and to, and to get those back in people's hands more quickly. Um, I think also this is a little bit in relation to your last question and not this one. One of the things that we like to do is combine other sources of data. So the Earth Observation Lab in the, in the university where I work looks at slavery from space. Um, I don't think we would necessarily, I think that if we could get climate data, for instance, especially right now in the Horn of Africa, and we can look at 
the ways that those that that climate displacement combined with conflict displacement combined with sort of um, uh, displacement conditions. I think if we can pull all that data together, it might communicate what the importance of some of the findings and in ways that interventions, more interventions than might be appropriate, right? So we could look at climate responses that are leading people to have, for instance, you know, in the highlands in Eritrea, if they're not, if farming is being reduced or something, right? Or if there's flooding in Ethiopia. In within the region, um, addressing climate, using different data, communicating it maybe along those uh, messages would be more useful or appealing to policymakers. Thank you. I think that's uh, quite inspiring and, uh, and maybe um, yeah, and able to think about like uh, concrete steps to take. And there's a question by Jenny in the chat that uh, ask about the gender dimension in your research. So asking, you know, about the different experiences of men and women. Um, and if you can touch on your research on forced marriage. Yeah, so um, in terms of the gender dynamics, what we found was that largely uh, the biggest takeaway is were that people's distribution of caring responsibility and livelihood or socioeconomic income um, led to their vulnerabilities, right? So the way that the pandemic affect, affected people along gender lines often had to do with the kind of work and the responsibilities that they had. So within Sudan, domestic workers, for instance, uh, saw a massive increase in exploitation and an increase in sexual violence and, and um, domestic violence. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the inability to leave the house or to seek safety or um, to communicate, uh, you know, with caregivers, um, for instance. But we also saw, again, uh, agricultural workers who are unable to cross the border into Ethiopia um, or from Ethiopia. They're seasonal, um, but because the border was closed, they're forced to use irregular routes. Those tended to be men. So that led to an increase in their vulnerability. Um, and uh, the transitional government changed, um, ratified a number of conventions, but they changed the age of marriage for children from age 10, which is what it was uh, for girls. Um, and uh, we saw, at least in interviews, and this didn't come out in relation to Eritreans, it came out in relation to Sudanese, that um, in times of economic crisis, uh, in, in exchange for a dowry, children were more likely to be forcibly married. Um, and that that also increased um, when schools were closed. Um, we didn't follow that in this study and it didn't come up at all, but uh, that came out of the first round of stuff in Sudan. Thank you.